to like you know travel to the other side of the world and have all these people come out and see you it's crazy um forgive me if i'm a little bit rough to start off with i've never spoken this early in the morning before it's quite a strange thing to do i'm, I'm used to kind of speaking in the evening with like people and beer and stuff and so yeah um i'll try and i'll try and kind of warm up as i go along um so Hi, my name is Hi, my name is Hi, my name is mr bingo um <laughs> Yeah, my talk's called 37 Things I've Learned. Um, this is kind of what I, what I was going to bring over all the time, and then um, I got an email from you or Tess or someone saying, can you do a talk about transparency? And I said, no, but I'm going to do my talk, and I'll, I'm just a very transparent person. I'm very transparent, <laughs> very, very honest. So I kind of is going to be about, it is transparency. So yeah, kind of, you know, got it in there. Um, so an introduction to me, I'm from here. Um, in 1998, I played bingo uh, in Gala Bingo in Maidstone in Kent. I got the nickname Bingo. Um, I won 141 pounds and 27p, got the nickname Bingo. Been called Bingo ever since then, just added a mister to it. Uh, um, I like drawing people on trains. I like taking photos of children when they match objects perfectly, uh, even the shoes. I collect postcards with one person in, I've got about 94. Um, I was a commercial illustrator for 15 years, did lots of work for magazines and uh, advertising, posters, um, did some animation. No one really knows about this stuff, it's really, I, I have a habit of doing stuff, then I get bored of it. So I was like, bored of being an animator now, so I took it all off the internet so people stopped asking me to do it. But. Sort of weird. Um, yeah, but I did book covers, um, stuff on walls, um, whoopee cushions. <laughs> buy this, by the way. If you don't like Trump, buy this. All the all the money goes to charity. Um, done stuff on TV. Dave. Good boy. Why is he called Dave? The person that had him before me called him Dave. Uh, I've done packaging. I've done wallpaper with really, really weird stuff going on in it. Um, and I send offensive postcards to people. I've been doing this since 2011. Some sort of weird projects that I started doing um, turned into art by mistake. Um, started getting taken seriously as art. Um, got lots of global press. Last year I did a Kickstarter um, to make a book about the project. Um, I wanted to do something good for the video, so I did a rap video. Um, it looks like this. Before the internet, communication was more intimate You wrote a letter, got an envelope and put it into it Then, as if some act of magic like a unicorn You put it in a red box and a man in a uniform Takes it, puts it in his bag and delivers it Now pay attention to this section if you still give a shit uh, I funded in nine hours Nine hours um, And then what happened is I decided I was bored of working as a commercial illustrator and so I decided to stop working for clients and uh, become an artist. Just decided to call myself an artist. Uh, deleted my website, um, got rid of everything and, and this is kind of where I am now, sort of at a crossroads, not sure exactly what I'm doing. Um, I don't really like the analogy of a crossroads really because it sort of suggests that you're definitely going down a path and you have to take, a, take some kind of direction. So I prefer this, I'm just kind of... I don't know, just floating around on a big empty sheet of paper, just uh, overwhelmed with the possibilities of life, seeing what happens, you know, just playing. I've got some new ideas, these are some of my new ideas. Um, some of them are okay, none of them are great. Um, this, is, this is the kind of thing I'm doing at the moment, this is an advent calendar, I um, did this a few weeks ago, it's just available online now. And um, yeah, basically each person is a different number of the month, 1 to 24 of December, and you scratch off the clothes so you reveal, reveal them. Um, and uh, yeah, it's just quite fun. So you start off with like that, and then it, just before Christmas Day you get that. So anyway, that's an introduction to me. That's sort of what I do. This is my talk now, 37 Things I've Learned. Um, 
Some of you might find some of this stuff interesting, some of you might not. It's, it's very personal, it's literally just 37 things I've learned over the last 20 years or so. And um, you know, if all of you, if like, if all of you go away with one thing maybe from it, that'll be, I'll be happy. Um, so let's go. Number one, don't have a plan. I never have a plan. I never plan anything. I just make stuff up as I go along. Um, I hate planning. I think it's kind of constricted. You know, const um, constricts you. And uh, I just, you know, I just make stuff up as it goes along and see what sees what happens. Um, I think that selling art is better than selling uh, coffee and computers. So you know, I, I used to do work like this in advertising. I didn't enjoy doing stuff like this. I did this so I could live in a house and eat food. You know, stuff like that. Stuff like this didn't enjoy it. Left me feeling kind of a bit dead and uh, you know soulless at the end of it. So I prefer doing stuff like this uh, and selling it to people, which is much more fun. Um, if you do nothing, nothing happens. It's a really obvious thing to say. Um, you know these people, hipsters. Um, I imagine. We're in this kind of area, right? You, you, you have hipsters here. A lot of people think I'm a hipster because I, I live and work in Shoreditch in East London and uh, you know, I wear silly clothes and uh, do creative things. But um, these are, what, what I find hipsters actually do is they mainly talk about stuff but don't really do it. So you know, they kind of meet up in like, trendy coffee bars or they stay up all night taking drugs and they talk about these cool ideas. Like, I'm thinking about making a film about poetry. I'm thinking about making a blog about, I don't know, whatever. But basically the difference between me and these people is I actually fucking do stuff. So um, yeah, start it. Um, if you've got an idea for something, start it. You know, if you've got an idea in your head and you and you don't do it, it's a, it's just a waste. You know, the only time when an idea is useful in your head is if you're incarcerated in prison for 23 hours a day, and it will keep you kind of occupied and entertain yourself with your thoughts. If you're in your prison cell, but if you're not, if you're in the real world. You've got to get the idea out, otherwise it's just a total waste. Um, I'm a massive contradiction. I'd love to be a musician. Secretly, I'd rather be doing music. And um, these are about 30 ideas I've got for songs. I sing into my iPhone all the time, and I, I sing the song in, but I never actually show anyone because I'm too shy. So um, I should listen to my own advice. Uh, don't chase money. This is something I always try and do. Um, whenever I make any work, I don't do it to try and get financial gain. You know, I don't do it to try and make money. I don't think about the end goal or any kind of financial result. I just make stuff that I want to make, and eventually I find what happens is if you do stuff that you think is good, and other people start really liking it, if it's good enough, money ends up kind of chasing you and coming back to you. Um, people are more fun than I thought. This is something I learned last year that I was really pleased with. So um, I did this project called Hate Mail, where I, I offered strangers, um, I, I offered to send offensive postcards to strangers. Loads of people bought them, um, and, and that was great. You know, so it was. It was really good because I, I kind of thought that people were boring. I thought most people were boring and very kind of like uh, vanilla and plain. And um, it, it was really nice to make something so silly and have people actually spend money on it. Um, when I did the Kickstarter, I offered loads and loads of really weird rewards. So, you know, things like this troll package. Like, I don't condone trolling, you know, trolling is a horrible thing. But um, if people are willing to pay me to troll them for a week, I will do it. And, um, you know, I just trolled people. So, this is a graphic designer um, from Manchester. <laughs> And you know, he'd, he'd done a brand for himself and I rebranded him and uh, you know, just doing stuff like this. So I just had to break, you just, you just have to break these people down, you know, over the week. Um, this is another one I did called Getting Shit Faced on a Train. I, I like drinking on trains, I find it a fun sort of hobby and pastime. And uh, you know, I offered this, this rewards people, say, um, you know, meet me at a station and we'll get shit faced on a train. And it was great, and people did it. Um, and uh, you know, I'm really proud that I own this hashtag, getting shit faced on a train. If you look this up on any social media, on Instagram or Twitter, I own every bit of content. What's really nice about having a, um, your own hashtag is it's kind of like you've got this lovely sort of visual diary of all the stuff you did with these people. And, and this one was really strange because um, so a lot of the Kickstarter rewards I did were kind of like mini art projects on their own. And this one was a really interesting moment. It was a sort of a social experiment because I'd basically meet five people and they were all kind of quite shy when they met up. And they're like, oh, hi, my name's Dave. I'm a graphic designer. Who are you? All right, yeah, nice. And then I'd hand the tickets out and then basically put them on a train and fire them through the countryside in this kind of like silver tube at about 300 miles an hour, drinking, drinking, loads and loads of booze. And it was kind of like a sort of condensed stag do or something. And, and by the end of it, so four hours later, we'd get off, um, so we'd travel for two hours out, get off the train for five minutes and then get on the train again and come back for two hours. By the end of it, everyone was just utterly pissed and they were like jumping on each other and they would become best friends and they'd all swap phone numbers and uh, they had private jokes. So one of the groups has still got a, um, a WhatsApp group that regularly chats. Brilliant. Um, this is the most weird experiential reward I did on my Kickstarter. Meet me for a pint in five years' time. 
I love the fact that people engaged with all this stuff. You know, this was two hundred pounds, and uh, all of these sold. Everything sold. So, you know, um, it's the only thing in my diary for the next five years. It's kind of sad. <laughs> I'm really looking forward to it. Seven thirty p.m. Don't listen to advice. Don't listen to me. Um, some of the most successful things I've ever done, people have told me before I did them not to do them. So it's really important to not, you know, take people's advice sometimes. Um, this is something I did when I was a student, so when I was about 20. Uh, I was at university and I did this uh, brief, it was a DNAD brief, um, to do this thing called ETI. And you had to come up with uh, a fun thing to go on the internet that you could play with. And um, I was playing around with Flash a lot of the time. Does anyone remember Flash? Yeah? Um, and yeah, I, I made this, I kind of came up with this idea to make this uh, kind of keyboard controlled thing where it's a sample, music sampling machine, you had all these different characters and you, you press different buttons and it was super complicated. So you press one, certain samples would play and other ones would turn off and stuff. My tutor at the time said, don't do it, it's far too ambitious, you're never going to be able to do it. And I don't know what you guys think, but I feel like when someone tells you you can't do something, that really like makes me want to really succeed even more. So I made the thing, it's a, it looked like this. And um, it won a DNA D, which is amazing. So, you know, it's just like good, good to not listen to advice. And um, this book that I did uh, on the Kickstarter, I was, I was chatting to a friend about it, like one of my best friends. You should never take advice off best friends because they're bored of you, they're bored of all the stuff you do. And they're not thinking about like new people that might come to it. And so he said, uh, no, don't do that. Everyone's fucking bored of that. Don't do that. Um, and I ignored him. I did it. And it was the uh, most successful UK crowdfunded book ever. So, um, yeah, fuck you, James Greenfield. Anyway. Um, <laughs> Never be satisfied. I'm never satisfied with anything I've ever done. I'll never be satisfied. I think, you know, if you're, if you're satisfied, if you're this guy, you should retire, you know, just kill yourself. Basically, if, if, if you ever want to retire, it's, it's sort of sad, really. It means you don't enjoy your job. Um, don't worry about things when you're in bed. This is something I learned, um, and uh, this is nothing to do with creativity or anything, by the way. Some of these are just general life tips, okay? This is like some kind of weird motivational talk. Um, I should be wearing a suit. And uh, yeah, basically, don't worry about things when you're in bed. I find that sometimes if you're in bed and you start worrying about stuff, you can get really overwhelmed with all these like silly problems and uh, you know, things. And, um, and it's just like you can catastrophize. And I find all you need to do is get out of bed and just, you know, do something else. Like, I get out of bed, I get on my bike, and I go riding, and everything disappears, all those problems and stuff. So um, yeah, don't worry about stuff in bed, just, just sleep in the bed. Um, let children take their own paths. Anyone got children? Congratulations. I don't have any children, but I, I used to be a child. And uh, when I was a child, I used to do these weird pictures. I used to do these weird, like, uh, you know, this is like uh, the most complicated way to kill someone. Um, I used to do stuff like this when I was about 11 years old uh, at school. Um, stuff like this, I went through a you know, kind of torture, torture phase. Um, and, uh, and the school phoned up my mum and dad. I uh, phoned up my mum and said, um, we're really worried about your son, you know, he's drawing these weird pictures. And my mum, to her credit, actually, I'm, I'm so pleased about this, she said, oh, don't worry about it, it's fine, he does it all the time. So she was, she was completely cool with it, and, um, and it was great, you know, she, they kind of encouraged it. And, you know, this is my mum and dad, she's a speech therapist, he's a estate agent, they're not creative. Um, they're not creative people, but they've always kind of supported this weird stuff that their son does. They don't really understand exactly what I do, but they never tried to make me, you know, wear a suit or earn money or, you know, do boring jobs and stuff. So, yeah, it's nice. Uh, trick clients, this is something I always, when I, when I was working as a commercial illustrator, I always tricked clients. And um, what I would do, basically, is they would give me a brief and I would draw exactly what I wanted to draw and then persuade them that's what they needed. And um, you should all do this. So, you know, things like this. This is in the Washington Post, a very serious newspaper. I persuaded them they needed two rats fucking in space. Uh, this is a really good example. I persuaded um, Camden Town Brewery in London that they needed this bottle of beer. They did it. Produced 5,000 of them. Um, be persistent. I think you've got to be really, really persistent sometimes to make amazing stuff happen. You know, you've got to really, really try. So, when I made this rap video last year, which I showed you a little bit of earlier, um, this is a mood board I made for myself when I was having a meeting on my own. And uh, this is kind of what I imagined my rap video was going to look like, okay? So like, this is me at the front, that's me. And then behind me is my squad. 
And um, you might have different words for this. Uh, squad, posse, gang, roadmen, mandem, crew. Um, but yeah, basically they're the guys that stand behind you and make you look cool uh, in, in your rap video. Um, and I was thinking, where am I going to get these people from? I need authentic looking kind of urban hip hop people. It's got to be perfect. And um, I thought I could use my friends, but it would look a bit like this. <laughs> So I did this, um, I put this on the internet. Yo, do you want to be in a rap video? And uh, I asked people to send me a cool photo of themselves to me. And most people sent photos, they weren't quite right, it didn't look right. And so I abandoned that idea. And then I thought, I'm going to pretend to be a street caster because I went to my local shopping centre called Stratford, uh, Stratford um, Westfield in Stratford. And this is where you kind of find these kids that I thought would be perfect to be in my rap video. You know those kids that are like, really kind of, uh, sort of, um, aggy and they kind of walk around in their tracksuits and they've got loads of attitude and swag and they're like, yeah. And I thought, I'm going to go there and I'm going to pretend to be a streetcaster and I'm going to flatter them and say, hey, you look really cool, do you want to be in a rap video? And so I went up to this group of teenage girls, it was a really busy Saturday morning and I was like, hey, uh, what's up, you guys? Um, I'm a streetcaster for a rap video. I wonder if you're interested in being in it. You look really cool, you've got a really good look. And one of them went, Who's the rapper? And I went, um, oh, it's, a, it's an up and coming artist. Uh, I can't tell you, can't disclose that information. And then one of them went, what channels is it going to be on? And uh, they were talking about like young people stuff, and I was getting all confused. They were talking about these sort of like urban channels you get within YouTube, you know, like Channel U and SVTV and stuff. And they could see I was getting confused and flustered and kind of looking at the ground and, um, you know, kind of fluffing my words a bit. And I was clearly out of my depth. And one of them just looked at me and went, are you a paedophile? <laughs> So I was in this busy shopping centre, there's people walking all around the place, and these teenage girls, I was going, I'm not a paedophile, stop saying that. It was awful. And then I, I sort of went for a beer on my own at lunch, and I was kind of like, fuck, how am I going to do this? Come on, you've got to do this, you've got to, you've got to make this work to get it right. It's going to be worth it. And I spent the rest of the day walking around the shopping centre with a clipboard, just following groups of teenage boys in tracksuits, going, oh my god, that'd be so perfect for my rap video. But didn't speak to any of them, and it's amazing I wasn't arrested, and it's one of the worst days of my life. And, um, and then I had one last attempt at getting these people and um, I remember this kid I saw called DC Scribbler, he's a rapper, he's really good, he was 17 years old and I saw him at this open mic night near my house in this cinema called Rich Mix and um, it's really nice, it's just like a local event and they get kids to come on and uh, do like spoken word and um, beat poetry and rap and R&B and stuff and I remember this kid, he was really good, 17 year old schoolboy, and he was half Canadian, half South London and um, he was really good and he came with his own little crew and I followed him on Twitter and I remembered six months later and I was like, this guy would be so perfect for my rap video. Um, so I sent, him a, I sent him a tweet and I was like, I've got an opportunity. And uh, he was like, all right, yeah, DM me, bruv. And we, we direct messaged each, each other and it was kind of difficult because this is before Twitter opened up direct message to over 140 characters. So basically in 140 characters or less, I had to persuade this 17 year old kid that I was making a comedy rap video, I was a joke rapper and it was a video to promote a book on an online crowdfunding platform and do you and your friends want to stand behind me and make me look cool? And he said yes, it's amazing. <laughs> so he did it, got a squad, it was great. I mean, <laughs> essentially, I, I, you know, essentially I groomed a 17 year old boy and got him to meet me in a disused uh, kind of graffiti drug addict park and gave him a hundred cans of red stripe and a bag of money, but it's all fine. But the point of this long story is it's worth persisting at stuff to make nice things happen. Um, you don't always get rewarded for work, hard work straight away. This is a kind of similar thing really. You know, I spent a lot of time planning my Kickstarter last year and thinking about this rap video actually, just late at night. You know when you're kind of in your studio on your own, just working until like the early hours of the morning, and you know that everyone else is in their houses watching TV and having this comfortable life, or out drinking, or doing nice things and socialising, and you kind of sit there and think, why am I doing this? What's it, what, is, what is life all about? Why am I doing this? And then, you know, you realise you get rewarded for it kind of like much later on, and it, it all becomes worth it, you know, so like, doing all this stuff meant that I got to make this self-published books always been on my bucket list and a failed kickstarter's always been on my bucket list so please invest or I might turn to incest marry my rich sister and live off her interest <laughs> yeah so you can make stuff like that it's great with all the work um, another thing I learned from doing this project was like working with people who can do stuff that you can't is really really good um, so I, I spent most of my life just doing very solitary work I've always just worked on my own um, never really worked in teams, never had a proper job or anything. 
and never really tried working with other people. And then for this Kickstarter project, I had to learn a lot of new stuff. And um, I learned that working with super, super talented people that can do stuff you can't is amazing and you can make great stuff happen. So um, this guy's called Darren Wall. He works in publishing and he helped me kind of run the Kickstarter campaign. And he taught me about book binding and paper and printing and how to make a book and all this kind of stuff. Um, this guy's called Eli Sostra. He's a um, like producer, hip hop producer in Brooklyn in New York. And um, I got in touch with him and he gave me the beat for my track. Uh, this guy's called Reese and he's a um, sort of sound engineer and producer. And uh, I managed to, on like a tiny budget, record my rap track in his house in a kind of set up home recording studio. Um, these guys are called uh, Rex and Luke and they're from like a film production company called Oldie. They're a bit like me, they're kind of like nerdy white guys in their 30s who secretly wish they were in the Wu-Tang Clan. Um, <laughs> And then this guy is called uh, Al, he's a graffiti artist and he helped me find uh, locations on the shoot and did this uh, really nice big bit of graffiti behind me for them. And then obviously DC Scribble who I talked about. So like all these people are super talented and can do amazing stuff that I can't. And uh, you know, just great to have this amazing pool of talent to make a great thing. People respect honesty. I've always been really, really honest with everything I do. And um, I find that just doing, doing stuff, being really honest as a person or a brand or a company or whatever you are makes you kind of bulletproof, you know? Um, so like, I did things like this. When I was working as an illustrator, I did this pricing structure to, um, to encourage clients to understand what I wanted to do and what I didn't want to do. Um, and when I did the Kickstarter, um, you do, uh, you do um, what's this called? Um, an update, yeah, you do updates every so often to update the backers, tell them what's going on, if things are a little bit behind, or you know, just how things are going, how things are progressing. And um, I got pissed off when I was doing my Kickstarter, there were so many people kept hounding me all the time, saying, where's this book, where's this book? And a lot of people that, didn't un that backed it didn't understand that they were actually like backing a thing to, that was going to be produced and manufactured and made, and it's something you get in the future. Lots of them just thought I had this big pile of books, and they just bought a book. So I did this um, update called Impatient Cunts, and uh, it was so honest, and it slagged everyone off, all the customers that bought my thing, and it was the most liked and positively commented update I'd ever done on my Kickstarter. So it's amazing. Um, don't do this, by the way. I'm the only person in the world that can do this. Um, I get bored of people asking me to work for free, so I, um, when I used to, uh, before I deleted my website, I had a little section, uh, which was kind of like an FAQ, you know, for clients, uh, does Mr. Bingo work for free, and then if you clicked on it, this came up, and it was kind of like, it really, it was angry that you'd even clicked on the button, um, and again, it, it kind of worked in my favour, you know, it was really positive, this stuff, so clients really respected it and liked it, people shared this a lot, um, people liked it so much it even turned into a print, um, yeah, it's crazy. Cats don't like being held by children. This is something that a lot of people don't realise. And um, there's hundreds of thousands of photos of it on the internet and it's all completely pointless. It's a waste of time because the cats are always really sad and the children are always happy. It's the same every time. Um, there's some more, yeah, just sad cats, happy children. There's so many of these, you know, we've, we've got to stop doing it. It's a waste of everyone's time. He doesn't love her. <laughs> People like laughing. Um, this is something I realised, I, you know, as I said, I try and make funny work and um, it's, it's useful if you can make people laugh because um, I kind of realised this at an early age. So when I was about eight years old, I was doing these pictures um, and uh, my mum and dad kept all my drawings, which is really nice to, have to look back at them. And so I was into football and I was kind of doing drawings about um, words and phrases in football, making these little comic strips. And um, I remember showing these to my friends and my parents and my parents' friends and people laughing at them and I got a really nice kind of reaction from that. I thought I want to do more stuff like this, more funny work. Um, when I left university I was kind of doing stuff like this, didn't quite know exactly where I fitted in. I you know, wanted to be an illustrator but wasn't quite sure and just uh, knew that I was quite good at kind of humour and ideas and drawing and you know, how can I put all these things together. I started getting um, commissioned as an illustrator shortly after that for you know, doing work for magazines, sort of editorial stuff just doing funny work. Um, I can't remember what a lot of these are for. But. And then advertising. Advertising loves funny stuff because um, you know, people look at an advert and it makes them laugh, they get a nice feeling and they feel more kind of you know, warm or affiliated with that brand or product. So um, I got quite a lot of work in advertising doing funny stuff. So this is for a vodka 
Um, have fuck you money. This is, this is something I've always thought is really important. And what, what fuck you money is, is basically, it's having an amount of savings in the bank that mean you can get out of any situation, whatever it is. It might be a relationship or a job, but like talking about work really. So as a, as a freelancer, it's so good to have some savings in the bank because it means if you're really not enjoying working for a client, you can tell them to fuck off because you don't need their money to pay your next month's rent and it puts you in this really nice position. So I always have enough money to not worry too much about the sort of distant future. Um, the internet isn't the only place with interesting stuff. What's this about? Oh yeah. Um, I love the internet. There's loads of good stuff on it. We all know that. There's amazing stuff on the internet. It's full of brilliant things. But um, it's really nice sometimes when you find stuff in real life, I think, still. So like, I was just walking around in Cornwall once and I walked into this uh, church. And um, you can just go into churches. And I found these prayer mats. And they're amazing, I just think they're so beautiful. They kind of remind me of like um, really, really early computer games, like Asteroids or something. Um, but yeah, it was really nice to find these. I feel like I wouldn't have found these on the internet. And it's so much more rewarding to actually find stuff in real life still. Um, touched on this already, but yeah, people still think it's okay to work for free. I'm always shocked by this. It's such a strange thing within the kind of creative industries. I'm sure all of you are aware of this. Um, this is an example, really. Recently, I got this email from someone um, doing like PR marketing for Game of Thrones. Right? You've all heard of Game of Thrones, one of the biggest TV programs in the world. And um, they were like, yeah, um, we wondered if you wanted to you know, make some art for an art exhibition in central London. And uh, I kind of knew that it was one of these things where they might not have any money. So I didn't say, do you have a budget? I said, what's the budget? And uh, she replied and said, um, there isn't any budget, it's an incredible opportunity for your work to be exhibited along the Anyway, total bollocks, right? So um, what I did is I didn't reply to the email, but I just took it, screen grabbed it, um, I blurred out her name, Emily, and, uh, <laughs> and I put it on Twitter, um, because I know I've got this nice following of people that know I like talking about working for free quite a lot, and you know, I like to share this stuff. And so what I did is instead of replying to the email, I kind of let the public reply, so I put this on Twitter and Instagram, and then you know you see all the comments, and uh, people are going mental, getting really threatening. And what was great is that um, you know it gets talked, it gets talked about so much that they, it does the work for you, so you don't need to complain back to that company. It's great, and um, you know ended up getting 84 retweets, impressions. I don't understand exactly what impressions are, but it got 46,240. I don't know. Does that mean 46,000 people saw it? I don't know. I think a lot of people saw it. Um, and it was great, and then this woman called me an hour later after it had gone online and was like, Hi, I understand you've been talking to one of my um, colleagues. Uh, I was like, yeah, yeah, I have actually. And uh, she said, we just, um, we just don't understand why you find it so funny, and you keep putting this, this stuff on the internet about us. And I went, yeah, it's just this, uh, it's this weird thing that most people I know find the concept of working for free is really funny. Anyway, we had this argument, and it was annoying because I hung up, and um, you know when you have one of those phone calls and you wish there was something much better you could have said afterwards. Like I was going to say, um, are you getting paid for this phone call to talk to me right now? Yeah, you're like, well I'm not, so fuck you. But I didn't say it, it's annoying, next time, anyway. It's okay to give up. I don't mean like, you know, give up, kill yourself. And like, I just mean like, if you've got creative block, it's okay to give up. And um, what I do when I have creative block, I don't want to like sit at my desk and kind of just work my way into some kind of crazy place trying to, trying to solve a problem and I just sort of go, I just change my environment. I find that's really useful, just, just go away and do something else and stop worrying about it so much, you know, and uh, I find it's really helpful and I, I actually don't really come up with many good ideas at my desk. I tend to come up with most of my ideas when I'm kind of doing other activities. I come up with lots of good ideas in the shower for some reason and I come up with good ideas when I'm cycling. It's almost like, I don't know, um, you know, this would be probably my like ultimate idea place to be like cycling naked in some rain or something. Um, what's the worst that can happen is something I always ask myself, and I think other people should ask themselves more. So like, um, you know, this, this is bad. Okay, this is really fucked up. This is um, this is refugees falling off a boat in the middle of the sea. Probably a lot of people in this photo might have died. I don't know, but um, I think it's important to remember stuff like this. So like, everyone in this room is probably really quite super privileged. I mean, I don't know any of you. You might have had really, some of you might have had a tricky life, but mainly like compared to the rest of the world and stuff like this, we're all quite privileged. And um, I think it's a kind of a shame that lots of us um, complain about our lives all the time and complain about our jobs, but we don't change it. And um, you know, so basically, we should be taking much more risks because we're privileged, and so you know, we can afford to. Um, be personal, this is something I always do with my work, so I love social media and Twitter and Instagram and I love kind of replying to anyone that talks to me on there and kind of 
doing work that sort of engages this really lovely audience I have. If Mr. Bingo did a portrait of me, it would make my year. So I sent her that. Um, <laughs> And you know, when people buy stuff, I like, uh, you know, there isn't like a team of people working for me, or it doesn't get shipped from a factory or somewhere else. I, I ship everything myself, and I handwrite the name and address on the, uh, on the packaging. People love it. They really, really enjoy this stuff, and they, you know, they keep this stuff. And, um, and you know, I do like really personal stuff, so if you buy a signed book from my website, I have like a signed dedication box, so you can write anything you want to be written to you. Can, you can ask for a specific little, little drawing or message, and then people get this super, super personal stuff in their book. And people love buying these as presents for people because it's just, each one is completely unique and personal. Um, and you know, I write things like that on the package. People like that, they like that. Um, everything has an ending, that's sad, isn't it? This talk will have an ending, can you believe it? Um, but what I'm talking about really is that just like, you know, stuff changes and um, society changes and fashion changes and technology changes. And I think lots of people and companies, and you know, especially in the kind of creative world, get left behind sometimes. And that's why a lot of, a lot of people fail, because they don't keep up and change, you know. It's, it's really important to remember that. So like, I know whatever I'm doing now, I won't be doing in five years' time. And that's cool, you know. I don't know what I'm going to be doing, that's kind of exciting. Uh, don't try and please everyone. Um, I always think it's, uh, it's much better to have like a um, hundred people that absolutely love something you've done than a hundred thousand people that have seen it and are just kind of like, mm, you know, don't really remember it. Um, life goes slower when you're walking. Does anyone here like walking? I mean like proper walking. Like walking around cities is nice, but actually going out into the countryside and walking is amazing. Something I really love doing. Um, and uh, yeah, life goes slower. It's a really obvious thing to say, but basically, like people in cities. Uh, I mean, I live in a city, but often, like people in cities, time is like you're really busy all the time, super busy, and time goes really fast. You know, when people always say, "Oh my God, it's six o'clock already. How did that happen?" And you know, your life is kind of like firing away. But I find if you go walking all day, um, it's amazing, and time like just drips past. The seconds drip past, and time goes really slowly, and it kind of like makes your life longer, which is kind of what we all want, right? Um, high treason has become a lot more relaxed recently. So um, high treason is a crime of disloyalty towards the crown. One of my Kickstarter rewards was called Dirty Queen, and I offered to send a, um, an envelope with a drawing of Queen Elizabeth II in a pornographic position with the stamp as her head, like this kind of thing. And, um, and so I sent this, so this is another one of my Kickstarter rewards, it's like a sort of mini project on its own. And I sent these out and uh, they get a bit more risque as they go along. And it's, uh, it's, it's, too, it's too early for that, that's too much. But um, people saw these and they said, you can't do that, you can't, you can't do that. It's, it's, uh, it's treason, you know? Like, and if I'd done this 100 years ago, I would have been hung, drawn and quartered, you know? But um, it's become more relaxed, I think, and I think I've got away with it. So, you know, this is mainly what high treason is. It's murdering, starting wars, murdering, uh, forging stuff, helping enemies, violating. But, you know, they've all gone out and uh, I think it's okay. Uh, business is complicated, i found. I mean, um, I, I, I like doing creative stuff. I hate numbers. I don't really like money and all that sort of stuff. Um, my Kickstarter raised 135 grand and if I thought I was rich, because um, my, my target was only 35, so I've got this extra money, but this is actually what I spent on. It's nice to actually tell people. So, drops, pledges, that's for people's cards and works and stuff. Uh, Kickstarter fees, book pre-production, rewards, delivering the rewards, printing the book. Uh, postage was 20 grand, um, making a bookmark, uh, paying the guy that gave me the beat, uh, rap video, all this stuff. Gave some money to charity because I felt guilty about the amount of money that I'd made. Um, mistakes and like, that was actually the end, that was the profit I got out of all of it. It looks like a fucking French fry. <laughs> I think anyone can be an artist. Um, you know, I'm just deciding that I'm an artist. It's quite nice just to come up, you know, just, it's up to you. Um, I was chatting to this woman I know who's like a, a curator. She. Um, you know, she owns an art gallery and puts on shows, and I said, what is an artist? And she said, uh, you know, an artist is someone who is accepted as an artist by the art world, but I think that's bollocks, I think that's really kind of pretentious, and the art world's very stuffy, I think. Um, I think it's nice to just, you know, just say you're an artist. Like, if you make something and people buy it, or even if they don't, if you just make something and put it on a wall, you're an artist, it's fine. You don't have to be accepted by the art world. Um, why? Because he uh, wrote a letter to a magazine in 2003 called .NET Magazine, they were talking about up and coming illustrators and they, they liked my work and they said, this is like something you might want to watch for the future, one to watch. Um, we like his work, we think he might turn into something one day. 
And this guy called Martin Olli hated it so much, and so he wrote a letter to a magazine. So bear in mind, this is 2003, so it's kind of before like internet comments and stuff like that. So people actually used to write a letter to a magazine, and then the, the magazine would print it, and then people read it. Um, and he wrote this letter, he hated it, it was sort of like, quite frankly, the work represents what preschool kids are producing every day at kindergartens all over the world, there was no talent composition or something. Anyway, he really didn't like it, and I thought, okay, Martin, um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and become as successful as possible, and I'm going to put you in bits of work. And so that's what I did. And um, this is one of the first ones. It's, in a, it's an editorial piece, and so I just wrote on this marker pen, Martin Olli, permanently thick. Um, <laughs> this is a more obvious uh, one that I attack in, a, in my first book in 2010. Um, I did an interview, and they asked, uh, do you have any fuck yous you want to hand out? And I said, yes, Martin Olli. Um, this is one of the biggest ones I did. So it's this big mural I did in um, a, a hamburger joint in London called uh, Byron Hamburgers in South Kensington. And in the middle of the bowling pin, it just says that. Um, and it's great people eat their dinner under this every night. No one knows who it is. Um, I did a packet of stickers just for fun as a sort of product to sell. And on the back, it's uh, there on the instructions. And then the most recent one I did in, in my mo most recent book, when you do a book, uh, like a traditional kind of author thing is that you're meant to uh, like thank people in the back of the book. So you like thank your wife or your children or something. And uh, I did a no thanks just for Martin. Um, and then what's weird is that I've basically been systematically abusing him for 14 years and it's kind of got this cult following, a lot of people talk about this and everyone wants to know who he is and does he know about it and he came out of the uh, woodwork so yeah, December 2015 he appeared on Amazon and left a review uh, for one of my books and gave me two out of five which I thought was quite cool because he could have given me one um, and he's brilliant and so he's responded to it and uh, he says that his, uh, one of his kids found out about it and then bought him one of my books just to piss him off, which I love. And he's actually quite funny, I sort of like him now, I kind of like Martin Ali, but I'm going to carry on abusing him because there's too many people following it and, you know, it's, I need to keep him happy. Doing nothing is good for you, this is something I found out really recently. So I've always spent my whole life kind of um, working, well, since the age of about 19, I've worked really, really super hard. I became obsessed with kind of being busy all the time and trying to be really successful. And I was one of those people that thought it was cool to be busy, you know, it's like, oh, I'm too busy, I'm really busy, I'm so busy, I'm busier than you, I'm busier than everyone. Um, and then uh, recently I had a sort of like this amazing midlife crisis, and what I decided to do, because basically what happens if you make a rap video, it's like the peak of your career, and it's kind of downhill from then on, and everyone was like, what's the next big thing? And everyone gets obsessed with what the next big thing is, and so I thought I've got to go away and be a cliche artist and come up with my new big idea and concept. And uh, so I hired a motorhome, and uh, went travelling around the southwest of uh, England for two weeks on my own. And the idea was, yeah, to go away and come up with this big idea, find myself in nature, and come up with some amazing art and creativity. And what happened is, after two days, I just, uh, my gut feeling was to just not do anything. And I realised I wasn't coming up with any ideas, I wasn't doing any work, and I was just doing nothing. And it was really nice, and I just suddenly realised for the first time, actually doing nothing's great. Just give your brain a total, like, um, break, you know, for like a couple of weeks. And so I just went walking along these beautiful like stretches of coastline, so walking about 15 miles a day, and I, you know, I saw interesting stuff like a red cone. And, um, and what's really great about spending time on your own with nothing to do is you just have all this free time, it's amazing. And um, you can kind of be curious like a child and just like investigate stuff. So I saw this and I was like, what's that? That's interesting, I wanna know what's going on in there. I knocked on the door and this bloke called Neil came down and um, he was really interesting, I just chatted to him, and he basically, he's like a bored, retired man, and he just stands all day, just looking at the sea, like that, just making sure nothing's going wrong. <laughs> um, and I found it really interesting, and you know, I met this guy as well, this is in somewhere called The Lizard, which is like the southerly most point in the country, it's super, super backwards, and everyone's kind of inbred, and um, it's sort of like going backwards 70 years or something, but... Yeah, so he was, he was really strange, just sitting outside his house, and he's put an advert up in his house looking for a woman. And he's really sexist, so it's probably why he hasn't got one, but, um, yeah. And I just spent a lot of time actually just, like, walking around looking at the sea. Like, I really love the sea. I spent a lot of time just looking at the sea, listening to, you know, music like uh, Changes by Black Sabbath. <laughs> This is the only drawing I did for the whole two weeks. Basically, you know, I decided to do nothing. Have any of you ever driven a motorhome? It's really weird. It's basically if you're used to driving a car and then you drive a motorhome, it's the equivalent in human form of basically suddenly having like a three-meter arse. And uh, 
I crashed into a fucking car in a small like car park in a fishing village, and um, I had to do a sketch of the incident for the insurance claims, and uh, so that was the only drawing I did for the, for the whole time I was there. It's the worst drawing I've ever done. Um, so that's kind of it, you know. Um, this is my last point. Don't listen to anything I've said because, like all humans, I'm totally full of flaws and contradictions. Um, if any of you have been making notes, there's a summary of everything I've said. <laughs> Cheers. <laughs> So, any questions? Any burning questions? Put your hand up. No? Yes. What happened to your campaign? Oh, you know about that? It was sort of a joke. Basically, um, what she's talking about is I put an advert in a bus shelter a few months ago saying, I'm looking for a wife. And, uh, so I did a talk at an agency, and it was one of these big ad agencies, and they, they owned this kind of like media space, a bus stop outside the building, and they said, if you do a talk here, you can put like a, a poster up to advertise your talk, or you can put anything you want in it. So I was like, okay, I'll do anything I want. And I thought about it for ages, and I was gonna do like maybe some kind of weird subversive advertising campaign, something taking the piss out of advertising, or just like, maybe just a straight advert for my book. And then I thought it'd be funny to do an advert saying that I'm looking for a wife. I wanted it to look like some kind of, I imagined it being like a middle-aged man in a suit who's had this like breaking down moment and he's just like, fuck it, I've given up with everything, I'm just going to put a big advert up. And uh, so yeah, that's why I did it. It was sort of a joke, 1% cry for help. <laughs> I didn't find a wife. I went on a couple of dates for it. Didn't lead to anything. Still looking. <laughs> if anyone's interested. Any other questions? Well, yeah. Come on. Yeah. What are you going to tell us, um, Well, basically, the reason I'm here is I got flown out uh, about eight or nine days ago by this conference called Promax BDA, and they wanted me to do a talk uh, last, last Saturday, which I did, and then they wanted me to do a talk um, in South Africa in about a week. So I had all this spare time in between, and I went on Twitter and said, does anyone else want me to do anything? <laughs> and uh, lovely people like this got in touch and said, yeah, why don't you come and do this? And uh, did a few things for Australian Graphic Design Association as well. Uh, does that answer the question? Yeah. And, and in between doing the talks, I'm like walking around, eating food and lying on beaches and it's like normal stuff. <laughs> well, I think we'll wrap it there. And if you have any other questions, you can chat with Bingo over there. We'll be here for the next 30, 40 minutes or so. Awesome. Thanks again. Thank you.